Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers. Um, uh, yeah, perhaps may maybe I need to tell you just a little bit about, about the Malaysian delegation and uh, our role in the, the COP. Uh, Malaysia represents uh, much more than Malaysia itself. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've heard that you've been to any of these forums before, but you uh, have heard the name Professor Gudia. Professor Gudia is, of course, uh, a law professor at uh, SEM Law, uh, University of Malaya, uh, and uh, has been uh, one of the key negotiators uh, for things like the uh, uh, CB, CBDR, I'm not saying, I'm saying, it's the CBD, the UN, UN CBD, uh, uh, Nagoya, uh, yeah, biosafety, a, a number of, of, of uh, uh, extremely important uh, uh, protocols and agreements. Uh, and is ex extremely uh, uh, skilled uh, and uh, uh, articulate uh, spokesperson. And for that reason, uh, he was, spoke, he was selected as a spokesperson for the like-minded developing countries, which is a group of uh, about 30 countries uh, in the world that uh, Malaysia is, is proud to be part of. And so uh, <clears throat> in formulating our collective position as like-minded developing countries, uh, these countries selected Professor Gudia to, to speak on their behalf. This gives him and Malaysia and the like-minded developing countries a lot of exposure. And uh, as you know, in negotiations, when you stand out, you set yourself up as a target as well. Um, for my part, uh, apart from being the, the, the lead negotiator for Malaysia, I'm also the coordinator of the Group of 77 in China. And this is, uh, I function as the overall coordinator, and I try and, and find areas uh, where the G77 in China, which, as you know, is, is a very large number of countries, uh, over 100 countries, can actually have common positions. And it's one thing to have a common position, it's one thing to agree on something, but it's very difficult, difficult to put that into writing because then every single word matters and it's extremely difficult. So I do have uh, a number of, of coordinators that handle specific themes. And these are from a number of different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, where G77 in China uh, is most in agreement is on the issue of the climate debt and the need for climate finance, for adaptation and for mitigation, and the uh, uh, the home uh, that that climate finance has is very clearly spelled out in uh, the articles of the convention, Article Four Point Three <laughs> specifically. But uh, uh, we also have coordinators for adaptation, for loss of damage, uh, for technology for capacity building, and these coordinators deal with, with specific thematic issues. But going back to the question, uh, Malaysia and the like-minded group of developed countries and the G77 were of the same mind uh, regarding the presence of observers in the negotiation. And this is because, as has Carl has pointed out quite, quite accurately, the negotiators and the governments do not function in a vacuum. There are numerous lobbyists constantly harassing all negotiators from all countries. Sometimes it's government to government, sometimes it's uh, business to government, sometimes it's NGO to government. But the position that governments ultimately take is a function of all of these plus what the governments themselves, as they get together, perceive as being a workable solution. Yes, we could take extreme positions, but that would mean that after two weeks, two and a half weeks for some of us, sometimes three weeks, we have nothing, we do not have an agreement. Right? And so, it is, a, it is a process of give and take, and sometimes the presence of observers in the room does make a difference, because then there, there is a physical presence of uh, entities in the room that have and, and that are known to have specific views and that are capable of carrying what they hear in those rooms out. So if a government uh, takes a position where they are blocking a position that is obviously something that many, many countries, particularly vulnerable countries and wealthy countries have interest in, then that is something that the world has to see. Many times, the formal meetings, closed groups, governments feel much more comfortable taking hardline stances and blocking issues that they shouldn't block, all right? And 
don't uh, uh, don't be mistaken about this. It was the G77 in China, the group of developing countries that were pushing for the presence of non-government entities in these meetings to ensure that there would be no buying off, bullying, uh, uh, or any other kind of, 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 of uh, high pressure negotiation, uh, for which some countries are, are known. Okay. Uh, I hope that. that uh... Yeah, it seems like what you mean, after all, is all about balancing the power inside the room. Um, on on the second note, um, I mean, when you talk about uh, you know trying to get everyone on board, usually we will have you know the bigger powers such as the U.S. to push other smaller countries into agreeing uh, with this COP21. I, I want to go to the next question because um, climate change has, has never been such uh, a, a top priority for Southeast Asian countries, not even for Malaysia. So how the U.S. lobbied Prime Minister Najib Razak into agreeing the agreement? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I'm not sure that, that that's the question. Yeah, I, I perhaps need to address the question in the first place. Um, everyone lobbies everyone. This, this is a negotiation. And so we have lobbyists everywhere. And as I said just moments ago, they, they, come, from, they come from business. They come from, uh, they come from entertainment sometimes, you know? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it is a very mixed bag. And uh, uh, I, I would uh, not be telling you the truth if I didn't tell you that, that uh, the EU lobbies extremely hard. Individual countries within the EU lobby, the UK lobbies extremely, extremely hard. And, and they, they come to you with, uh, with very, very strong points and very rational arguments. It's sometimes very difficult to, to uh, provide a counter argument, especially when you're speaking as a group. But uh, uh, as and I think, and I think you used the word correctly. It's a balance of powers, and that this is why coalitions exist within the negotiations. The U.S. doesn't operate alone. The U.S. operates as, as part of the umbrella group, which is uh, the U.S., Russia, Japan, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, one more somewhere. Yeah, Norway. <laughs> All right, and so and so as a group. Uh, where they can, they take positions and they push very hard, and, and it's difficult to to push back against such a group. Uh, of course, the EU is, is its own very strong group of 28 uh, countries, um, and then and then there are other groups. Uh, there, there are groups uh, like the Environmental Integrity Group, which is uh, Switzerland, Mexico, Liechtenstein, Monaco, South Korea, and, uh, and and sometimes those groups which are a mixture of developed and developing countries, try to bring some semblance of balance in. But it, it can be very polarized. And, 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 you know, it, so within, within the G, uh, G77 in China, you've got uh, Association of Latin American States, uh, Independent uh, Latin American Countries, ILAC, uh, the Arab group, Africa group. Asia doesn't have a group, because the Asian group includes South Korea and Japan. And they're not the G77 in China. It's difficult for the Asian group to, to have a voice, which is why then we have had like-minded developing countries. So no, um, it would it would uh, not be true to say that any particular president or prime minister or king lobbies any other. It, phone calls happen. They happen all the time. They happen at 3 a.m. Okay, uh, our minister met with the, the minister of China. He met with the, the minister of Saudi Arabia, and yes, he met with John Kerry. Uh, and uh, 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 these were face-to-face uh, -face talks. They were very frank talks, and they were very difficult talks. And there was a lot of persuasion going on. But ultimately, I think what, what happened was we were able to convince each other that somewhere in between our positions was a position that we were willing to use as the framework to move ahead. I, I want to add on to that question. What was the deal maker? What made Najib? The all all governments all government. Uh, uh, Where is it in for uh, It's to, to be to be to be very frank. Uh, it's it's not any one thing that you can put your your finger on. As a matter of fact, it's many things that are yet to be decided. 
the, the, the addressing the climate does not happen at the Paris Agreement alone. Uh, I was going to, to expand a little bit and, and say that, that the international realm is, should account for less than half of what we do to address climate change. In fact, it's a very small bit. It's that bit with, 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 which, with which we agree between countries what we're actually going to do domestically. And that's the, that's the elephant, that's the 99%. Okay? Going and attending these things is just a little bit what we talk about, what we've done so far, what we think we're capable of doing, what we think we could do if we had more resources, more technology, more capacity, and how we're going to try to move ourselves from a downward spiral into an ambition cycle so that we can actually begin to, to um, pit uh, economic forces against economic forces. There are economic forces pushing for the status quo. How do we pit new technologies, clean technologies, green technologies, sustainable technologies, sustainable business against business as usual business so that the whole world can move together? So that we can get from a developing country status to developed country status without ever going through a phase of high high carbon emissions. Okay, so that that's the point. So um, the, the the deal maker, as it were, is what what do we see as as putting us in this ambition loop, where uh, uh, you know some are fond of saying, oh, now we're in a situation of action by all rather than actions by some. Many developing countries don't see it that way. Many developing countries said even before the, the, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, developing countries were already doing more than developed countries, with less resources, with older technologies, with less skilled people. All right, there was, a, there was a greater urgency among developing countries because they disproportionately bear the brunt of extreme weather events. I've got uh, relatives in Fiji right now, and their electricity is still on and off. And for, for a while, there were four days without electricity and running water. So, uh, you know, I just, I landed at 4.15 this morning, so excuse me if I'm a bit hazy on this. Okay, but yesterday I was meeting with Trick Talley, the U.S. lead negotiator. I was meeting with Laurent, uh, Laurent uh, Tugana, the, the French uh, 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 climate ambassador, who was, was the ambassador and uh, did a lot of work with, with uh, uh, Laurent Famir, who was the president of the COP. And the things we're talking about are things like, well, now, we, now that we've got to begin acting on the Paris Agreement and, and putting in place the bodies, organizations, the forums, the, the subsidiary bodies that we need, right? how do we rebuild Fiji in such a way that it's going to be resilient? That the next storm doesn't doesn't simply come in and take out all the, 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 the solar panels that you're going to put in. The solar panels are terribly aerodynamic, if you know what I mean. Okay? So, you, I mean, it, it's, if, if, if it's difficult, if, 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 it, if a storm can blow away a diesel jet set, what will it do to solar panels that are not employed in a manner that is adapted to changing climate conditions? Uh. Just the next question uh, is about Nicaragua. So why was it, uh, why was the country ignored during the closing plenary of Committee de Paris, and why they didn't receive uh, more support of, and what are the implications of supporting against uh, the Paris Agreement? Uh, uh, the, the last, the last one is is. Uh, I think, I think quite rhetorical. Okay, uh, if we didn't get the Paris Agreement, where would we be now? Um, first, I think that I think that we would have done a great disservice to the multilateral process. Okay, we've already had one big bust in Copenhagen, and uh, uh, the COPs in between have been essentially a process of rebuilding trust and confidence, both in the process as well as among ourselves as negotiators. Uh, and the meeting that I came uh, from yesterday uh, is a meeting, it's, 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 it's uh, billed as the first meeting following the COP. And it's a meeting of about uh, 30 major partners where they actually take stock of what was achieved and what was not. 
But uh, I cannot even begin to think about the situation now if we did not have the Paris Agreement. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a clue. But what I, what I would know is that we would be in a much worse position uh, if we were to begin thinking of, of how, as a global community, we would continue to address climate change through the multilateral process. The multilateral process is not an easy process, it's not a quick process, it is fraught with all kinds of bureaucracies, okay? But the idea that we use, uh, uh, well, I, I guess consensus, that the idea that is consensus-based means that you take a longer time to achieve that consensus, you might achieve a weaker consensus, but everyone is at the very least going to pull in the same direction. And there's much, it's a much better uh, environment than one where you know, you get a quick vote, you get a strong agreement, but, uh, you know, a decision, but then not everyone's going to pull when implementing that decision. Or they're going to pull in the opposite direction because they voted against it. You can't expect anything else. Right? So I think, I think that all these issues are, are, are important. I mean, all judging things are all. Oh, Nicaragua. Yeah. Uh, Nicaragua, Nicaragua raised an issue at, at, the, at the very last minute uh, that uh, uh, essentially called for, uh, at least in my personal opinion, uh, far too much change in the documents that were being negotiated. Um, much of, 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 of what is decided actually uh, dwells on familiarity. The, the more often you see a piece of text, the, 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 the more easy it is to understand, uh, to assess the implications for your country, for your coalition, the more likelihood it, it has of surviving. Uh, I think Nicaragua wanted to raise something that, that while it was relevant, uh, was something that was raised far too late to, first of all, allow them to explain what they were, were trying to push for. And second, too late, uh, more importantly, too late for other countries to assess what the implications would be if it were to be put down. To, like I said, things can happen very, very quickly on the surface in a conversation. But the moment you put something down on paper, immediately flags go up all over the world. Okay? There was a point uh, I, 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 uh, I recall um, at one of the, the intersessionals where I was just dealing with the 10 ASEAN member states. 10 ASEAN member states. And I just had a piece of text that called for sustainable development. And I couldn't get ASEAN to agree on sustainable development, if you can believe that. Okay, at least now, you know, ASEAN is, is much, once you get familiar with that and you understand what the scope of, of sustainable development is, then you can begin accepting that term as part of something you can believe. So I think that, that unfortunately, while uh, uh, the concerns of, of uh, Nicaragua were, were valid. And, and let me point out, Nicaragua is not the first and it will not be the last uh, country to be steamrolled uh, in, in this way. All right? uh, in fact, at the very same COP, South Africa, who is the chair of G77 in China, said they were willing to adopt the text as it originally was before the typo was changed. Right? And they were ignored. 